Okay. Once again, good morning and welcome to BC309, our course on urban church planting. We're going to pray and then we will get started. Can somebody please lead us in prayer this morning? Um, lead the class in prayer. All right. Who wants to pray? Avni, you want to pray? Sir, can I pray? Okay. Good morning, Pastor. Father God, we are so very thankful to you for a new morning that has come into our lives, Father. And as we come into your presence, Abba Father, we ask you to bless us. Bless us with the wisdom that we need today, Abba Father, to release your, as you release your word upon us. As we learn about urban church planting, Abba Father, as you're preparing us, equipping us to do your mighty work on this earth, Abba Father, in this time. Help us to be true salt and light on this earth. And Lord, bless everyone who is part of this group everyone with your wisdom with your favor bless pastor and bless entire team for all the other needs father we look up to your throne of grace continue to lead us guide us and strengthen us for all glory honor and praise belongs to you and you only in Jesus' name we ask and pray amen amen Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. And welcome uh, once again. Um, last week we um, last week we um, sorry my connection yes Um okay. Um can you can you all hear me? Shri, can you hear me? Um is my audio okay? Yes, Pastor, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. All right, I wasn't sure because I uh lost connection in between. All right. Uh so last week we were uh we were we covered uh the stages of growth and development. And then we talked a little bit about, you know, branching out, having more congregations and churches and so on. So uh, I'll just quickly review that and then we will move forward today just uh, looking at different uh, models of uh, people have pioneered and how they have grown. Uh, it's interesting um, to see um, different models uh, of church growth. Uh, of church planting and church growth. Um, it's not that we should copy these models, but it's good for us to learn from them and then see how God wants us to follow, how God wants us to uh, go about doing what he's called us to do, right? So um, uh, it seems like this connection is going up and down. Um, Okay, anyway, seems like it's a weak connection right at the moment. Okay, all right, okay, let's go forward. Uh, okay, just sharing um, my lecture notes. Uh, so growth and consolidation, we talked about each of these stages in which, you know, once you start pioneering, a work, a local church, uh, it's going to go through various stages of growth. And as uh, a person who's pioneering or as your, as your team is pioneering, you need to be aware, you need to be sensitive, and you need to change, uh, you know, adapt your leadership and adapt what's happening uh, as the church is developing through various stages. So you go to the pioneering stage, you go to the 
organizational stage, you go through a team ministry stage where you're developing the team. Uh, then you go through an equipping stage where you're equipping the believers. And then you go through, go into an apostolic stage where now you're thinking about expanding and multiplying what God has started. You know? um, there is no set timeline uh, to, uh, uh, according to which a particular church would journey through. Uh, there's, you know, we can't say, okay, two years here, two years here, two years, two years, two years. It's, it's not like that. It's just as the Lord leads you, as the Lord enables you, you know, you grow uh, the work that you've started. And then, you know, of course, the goal is to be self-sustaining so that this keeps on happening over and over again. Then we talked about multiplication and branching. So you could plant multiple congregations in the same city. Again, you envision people, you send them out, and uh, you can have these churches function independently, or they can function as one church with many congregations, or you could uh, have satellite campuses with live stream connections and all of that. Similarly, you can plant churches in other cities. Uh, same idea, that is, you're equipping people, you're sending them out uh, to plant churches, and these churches, again, could function independently, or they could be uh, your satellite campuses connected on live stream and so on. And then you provide a system for caring for these pastors and leaders and so on. So we covered till then. What I want to just share a little bit now is uh, to look at different, you know, what, what's happening uh, and church growth models. Uh, and, I, uh, and, and uh, of course, uh, we may not go into details, into every story. Let me see if there's a question on the chat. Um, Shri Kumar, you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I just want to know, uh, like nowadays, um, the, like as you said, like the online churches are, uh, you know, the um, live streaming thing is happening a lot. So is it um, okay that uh, there are some ministries, like uh, they are more focusing on the online, uh, you know, thing? Without a physical church, if a pastor wants to start just only the online ministry, to uh, whether it will uh, you know be successful because it's a, it's only online thing, and uh, uh, how you uh, you know uh, what's your opinion? I just want to know that. Thank you, sir. Mm. Um, so my thoughts, my thoughts are, are that yes, it it it, it is. Uh, 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 a means to serve people, you know. It, it, it definitely God can use it, uh, even an online church setting where people connect online and, you know, um, uh, you minister the word online, minister online. God can use it, uh, and you know, of course, you know, when when, when uh, globally we went through the pandemic, uh, many many churches uh, were doing that. And so the answer is yes. Uh, I do believe that part of that ministry is has certain benefit, um, but there is also a lot that uh, happens when we meet in person, which cannot happen online. So online has its limitations, of course. People, uh, it has its advantages in the sense that you know people from all different places can connect and received through the ministry. But it has its limitations in the sense that you don't actually get to see the people, sit down and talk to them, and you know the things that can happen uh, when you meet people in person. So if God leads somebody to say, do and to start an online church, well, I would just say, follow God, you know, uh, do it. And because uh, it will benefit in some way some people. It will benefit. It's not like there is zero benefit. There, there, there's no benefit. No. Uh, it will definitely benefit. The Word of God, as long as the Word of God is being preached and people are being ministered to by the Father, the Holy Spirit, it will definitely benefit people. Can it re uh, replace the in-person fellowship? And so? No, it cannot. Right? Um, uh, but if God leads somebody to do only an online church, okay, I would say follow God. If that's what God leads, leading somebody, there's nothing wrong. 
uh, understand the limitations, but do the best you can and let it serve people. Yeah, that's my that would be my response to it. Sir, uh, in that case, uh, what we are learning right now, can it also be applicable in that? Can we do that also? So the uh, uh, okay, let me say say it like this: uh, everything that we are learning in this course. Uh, is being given in the context of in-person church. So uh, with, you know, on, on uh, live streaming as, you know, some uh, a part of what happens. But the main focus is on the serving in the community, among the people, so on. So we are, that, that's what we are covering or focusing on in this course. Um, some of the things would apply can can be used uh, to an online church context but uh, i would say you know let's maybe if I, if I want to put a number i would say 80 percent of what we are talking about in this course is relevant for in-person physical church service you know, meeting people serving them physically uh serving them you know through the uh, being there in the community it's not relevant to online church um, but some of some of the things would of be useful because the online church doing a church online uh, the dynamics are very different uh, the uh, uh, the it, it can be done you know uh, but it's it's different you're, you're, you're going across um, regions and territories you're going across cultures uh, people from different parts of the world can connect and receive. And so the things we have to think through about and how to serve that kind of a community is different. Um, and, uh, you know, when you talk about evangelism, a lot of things we spoke about will not apply to an online church setting. So I would say, you know, maybe 80% of what we're talking about in this course is relevant to a local church, physical ministry maybe 20 percent can be used for an online church setting thank you sir thank you yes, okay all right interesting question and i uh, i never thought of it actually uh about uh, thinking in terms of an online church so uh, it is an interesting question thank you um all right Let's go back to the notes. Yeah. So we'll talk about some of these uh, churches. And uh, I'll just mention a few things. And, um, you know, I'm not saying all of them, you know, are, are uh, this is just to understand how people started the work and how it grew, right? So we get some idea. But it's very inspiring uh, when, you, when, you, when you study these, these different and these are just a few stories, right? So all of us are probably familiar with the Yodo Full Gospel Church, Seoul, Korea. Uh, so back in 1958, um, uh, uh, yeah, around that time, 1960, uh, Yonggi Cho, you know, he, he, at that time he was dying of tuberculosis. God healed him as a 17-year-old. And uh, the, this was just around the time of the Korean War and between North and South Korea and so on. A lot of things going on. But anyway, in the midst of poverty, in the midst of all of those things happening, God raised up uh, Yong, Yonggi Cho, started the church. And uh, God you know, taught him uh, how to grow the church. And he, he shares this. Of course, Yonggi Cho has gone home to be with the Lord. He's uh, uh, passed away. But uh, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you listen to some of his sermons online, or read his books. Um, uh, he shares, you know, the, the principles that God taught him on how to grow the church. But starting with five people, you know, uh, and of course his, uh, uh, he went to Bible college before that, and then he started, came out, started, starting with five people, along with his mother-in-law, who was supporting him, and they started the church. Uh, the church grew hundreds, thousands, Many thousands, right? Uh, eventually, um, seven hundred and fifty people. But 
750,000 people, maybe more than 1 million members actually, because they branched out in so many ways. But anyway, it's an interesting study. Uh, first of all, I would like to highlight the the principles of church growth, which Yonggi Cho shares. You know, how about how we learned the importance of having a big vision, uh, having a strong desire of prayer, uh, being a very important part. How we how he prayed and how he mobilized prayer, and uh, 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 so a, a lot of the work that took place there was uh, undergirded by prayer. Was you know, prayer was such a big part of uh, what took place. Uh, another important thing that we can learn from the work that took place there is mm, the, you know, what is commonly referred to as a cell church or cell groups, sorry, cell groups. So this was a big thing. Uh, and then of course it actually spread like a movement all over the world, but it started there in the sense that he organized it such so well, you know, uh, that the cell, cell group leaders, cell groups, and then how they multiplied. That was like a major part of um, the, the growth of that church. And then uh, later on, uh, uh, so when he moved uh, to Yoido Island, uh, started the work there, and then uh, you know built that facility to seat many thousand people. Uh, he was among the pine, I would say the early people to start up, you know, like satellite churches because and they couldn't fit everybody in one facility. So they connected many facilities through uh, satellite television. Or, you know, yeah, satellite television, that's how they connected. So he kind of showed the way that, you know, you can do this. If you have many, many people, they don't all have to be sitting in the same auditorium. Uh, you can connect across auditoriums through satellite. And so, you know, imagine 750,000 people uh, being ministered to, uh, I think, in seven services every weekend, but they're all uh, connected through many, through satellites. So they're not seeing the preacher physically. They're sitting in different facilities and everything is, you know, uh, and this is, we're talking about 80s, 90s, uh, uh, and of course, continued on through the 2000s. So, Again, that was, you know, in a way, showing, pioneering or showing the way how things could be done. Uh, another big part of uh, Yoridoful Gospel Church was uh, the, so we said about prayer, we said about cell group system, and we said about this multi-site facility being connected, they pioneered that. Uh, then I think a big thing that came out of Yoridoful Gospel Church was uh, missions. Uh, so they, they, they did so much, and they still, of course, have a lot of missions going on. So, so many churches planted um, globally, missionaries sent, churches planted all over the world. Uh, um, so, you know, so just think about one man dying from tuberculosis, God heals him, starts off with five people, and such a big work being birthed. Uh, there's so many important things that we can learn uh, of how God raised up, you know, that pioneering work. And they actually led the way for the whole body of Christ in many ways. Prayer, showing us the importance of prayer, having thousands of people praying, uh, the cell group system, the multi-site facility, the missions work. And also, I think an important, interesting thing is the uh, the effect, or, or let's say, the the work they did locally in their own city. For example, you know, starting universities. I think multiple universities uh, having a, a newspaper coming from a Christian organization. Uh, you know, so can you imagine a, a newspaper in the city that's written or produced from by a church ministry? Uh, uh, that means they're influencing society, influencing different spheres in the society. They, uh, they have a training institute, to technical training institute to train people. So many, many things came out, uh, which which can is a great model for us to look at. So while this was happening in Korea, uh, over in South America, in Colombia, um, uh, this is Pastor Cesar Castellanos. Um, of course, this came later on, but 
uh, he uh, had started his work and uh, you know he had a church of about 200 people and he was very discouraged he quit the ministry he gave up he left he went back to doing some some job he was working uh, but it was that time that god spoke to him and he said see you, your problem is your vision is very small uh, you know you get refresh your vision and uh, uh, go and start again so he went back and he started again and this time he took what he had he learned from beautiful gospel church from Yonggi Cho and he adapted that to the work there in Colombia so uh, primarily the 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 cell church model so when Caesar Castellanos uh, followed the same model he called it G12 so that all again become became very well known in those days uh, G12 means groups of 12 so he basically took took what was done in Seoul Korea the cell church and he adapted it to his situation his country his culture and and, and he just you know but then uh, it showed that uh, uh, that same concept could be used to Build a church, and 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 I think uh, the International Charismatic Mission grew up to about three hundred fifty thousand people. So again, it's a very big sized church, very very large work that was birthed there. And again, uh, very interesting is uh, here was a man who quit the ministry. You know, he gave up, uh, but then God, you know, sent sent him back and started afresh, and and God did such a big powerful work uh, through him. Um, Yesu Darbar, this in India again, it's a, dif a different story. And uh, um, this was actually a professor in an agricultural university. Uh, he was impacted through the ministry from Uppsala, Sweden. That was Word of Life Church, uh, which at that time was being led by um, Ulf Ekman. Uh, Ulf Ekman was impacted uh, through. Um, Rema Bible Training Center in the U.S. and also through, um, uh, I'm not kidding, uh, past, uh, to Le through Lester Sumrall, yeah, uh, uh, in the U.S. So he was impacted powerfully. He went back to Uppsala, Sweden, birthed a powerful ministry called Word of Life Church. And when Ulf Ekman was visiting Delhi in India, um, this professor, this uh, I'm not getting his name now. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm not getting his name. But anyway, he was a professor in agricultural college. He had a, he had gone to attend the conference, and uh, he was powerfully affected uh, at the conference. And then when he went back to his agricultural, you know, his college campus. Uh, something just started happening. They started a work which was taking place, you know, in a small way in their own home, and uh, the numbers of people started increasing. And they moved to, you know, uh, eventually they moved to an open field, uh, and so uh, it was more like a, a a big field of people coming in. And again, this all people working in the, the village parts, village uh, coming in. And uh, uh, it was more like every Sunday, about 50,000 people coming uh, to receive the preaching of the, the gospel uh, and the ministry of the Spirit. So uh, uh, the model or, or the work that took place was very different, meaning it was more of a healing, deliverance, gospel preaching, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, uh, among people who, let's say, were. Uh, you know uh, the the farmers, th those kind of people, those kinds of people. So uh, it was it was again a move of God, but it took place in a very different way. Uh, Calvary Temple. I'm just mentioning this, and then we'll have to go back in time. But uh, Calvary Temple, uh, Hyderabad, India. Um, Pastor um, Satish Kumar. Uh, yeah, so his ministry, I mean, his ministry, of course, is uh, 
primarily in regional language, uh, Telugu, uh, a local language. Uh, but what was is notable among in this in in Calvary Temple is the way they used media. So literally every morning, every evening, uh, Pastor Sadish Kumar's messages in the local language, in Telugu language, uh, is basically just blankets all TV stations, all TV, uh, local TV uh, channels, just covering. So I don't know, it's a massive number of TV programs happening morning and evening, just blanketing every, almost every channel possible. So with that and that impact and the good preaching and teaching of the word, uh, Calvary Temple grew to, I think now it's over 200,000 plus people. I don't know what the exact number is, but uh, it grew. Uh, the key here was the use of uh, media and the local language and the teaching of God's word, uh, we could say here. Yeah. Now, Crystal Cathedral, uh, very interesting because this goes back in time. That means uh, Robert Schuller's ministry uh, took place, we are talking now about 1950s. Uh, and Robert Schuller was a pioneer in many ways. Uh, he did a lot of things very differently. If you look, if you kind of look at the history of that message, uh, that ministry, because, for example, he was the first to pioneer drive-in church. So we're talking about 1950s. Uh, he uh, he moved to California uh, into a suburb where. Uh, People were beginning to, you know, uh, uh, up and coming professionally and so on. And he started a church in a kind of a, like a, I think it was a theater, movie theater kind of place. But he also said, if you don't want to physically come and sit in the church, you can just drive your car, stay in the parking lot, listen to the message and go. Now, you know, you think about this, this was back in the 19. 50s, 60s, those years, and you're thinking, you're telling people you can drive, do a drive in church. Uh, so it's just thinking out of the box. So he kind of did that. But that attracted a lot of people that they would just drive their car, park in the parking lot. They don't have to get off, they can listen to a message and leave. Uh, but then from that, they would eventually, you know, get into the church, become part of the church. Uh, some of the things, unique things that Robert Schuller did was, uh, he was the first one, I think, in those years to actually be on television. Uh, this was the time even when Billy Graham was, you know, as an evangelist was coming for very powerfully um, having these big stadium meetings. And here was Robert Schuller having one hour, a, a TV program one hour, where the entire service that was taking place at Crystal Cathedral would be telecast on television. So he was actually pioneering that, you know, uh, from that time, 60s, 70s, 80s on. Uh, so which was very interesting because, you know, you're doing something very new. You're doing something that not hardly anybody else is doing in the world. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, it is, but it is effective, and you know, in those days at least, it was new. You know, having a church service on TV, full one hour, TV is called, it's called the hour of power, and it went uh, not just in America but outside. You know, many other parts of the world uh, were, were also able to watch it. So uh, pioneering, and then of course he built uh, he built um, this big massive building called the Crystal Cathedral, became very world famous and all of that. Uh, but another important thing about Robert Schuller's ministry was the message. Uh, and again, this is a little controversial. I'm not saying oh, it's always it's all correct, but I'm just telling you how when he was pioneering the work, when he was starting his work, how he was being sensitive to the people he was serving, you know, to think that, hey, I can tell these people just come and do a drive-in service, okay. It's different, but at least they're coming somewhere close to church. And from there, they will come in. 
uh, to think about putting the church service on TV was very different in those days. You know, uh, for people to watch, you know, we, we, we would think, hey, church, you have to come and sit in here. But he's saying, look, I will bring the service to your home. Uh, so it was very different. And the third thing which I was going to share is about the message. And this is a little controversial because what Robert Schuller did was to preach a positive message. So today, you know, we talk about Joel Osteen. Many people talk about Joel Osteen. Hey, he only preaches uh, motivational, positive messages. But actually, it didn't start with Joel Osteen. It started back in the uh in the in the 60s with robert schuller you know that he at least in those days said i want to present a positive message about the word of god from the word of god now Today, of course, you know, would I agree with it? I wouldn't agree with it 100% because I believe you have to bring the whole counsel of God. We have to preach the whole Bible. But anyway, I'm just telling you what he did. Uh, he emphasized, he emphasized, you know, just preaching positively, like, you know, you can do it. Yeah, God is with you. Um, think positive, speak positive. You know, th those kinds of messages were constantly what he would preach, which attracted the people. So Crystal Cathedral became very well known because so many people were coming in California, uh, you know, because of these very innovative, very different things Robert Schuller was doing. Now, I'm not saying it was without controversy. I'm just saying that uh, this is what he did, and he had an impact on the culture. Uh, on that. And not only did he impact that, but from there, you know, Willow Creek, Bill Hybels, they learned from Robert Schuller. Uh, they learned from what he did, and that's how they developed the seeker sensitive model uh, and uh, so on. So there's a lot of connection happening uh, between generations. So Robert Schuller, previous generation, maybe two generations back, then you have subsequently uh, the Willow Creek Community Church. They were just following or learnt from what he did, and they did it different. You know, they adapted that. So, uh, you know, that's till number five. Uh, let me pause here. Uh, are you all with me, or are you all gone to sleep? Uh, are you okay? Everyone's following me. Yes, Pastor. Yes, okay. Yeah, just giving you a little. You know how how different people pioneered churches and so on. Uh, I'm not saying we should all imitate them. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, when they pioneered, they thought differently. They, you know, they affected culture in a different way. And uh, some things went good, some things didn't. But, you know, we can learn. We can learn. So let's go back. and um, So then, yeah, so Crystal Cathedral. Now, Calvary Chapel, again, is a very interesting story because this happened about the same time. This happened in the 1970s on the West Coast. So very interesting. Robert Schuller and Chuck Smith were both ministering in the same state in California. But Robert Schuller was targeting professionals, these people who are in, you know, buying yeah, they're they are living in the suburbs they are buying big houses etc and doing well okay but chuck smith he so what happened in the 1970s was um in the us and then it spread uh, around the world in different parts of the world was there was a hippie movement the hippie movement was basically uh, the a subculture where these people said, you know, I, I, they just dropped out of life. They got into drugs. Uh, they did, they just didn't care about anything. Uh, and so a lot of them, uh, uh, you know, basically they, they were living very loose lives as hippies. 
uh, not wanting to own anything thing you know and uh, that kind that movement started spreading but it started out there on the west coast uh, in, in 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 California and none of these people would go to church because they didn't fit in church we, you know they they, they 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 were they were into drugs they smelled bad they had long hair and they were like misfits in society but and they had their own kind of music you know but somehow chuck smith uh, opened his it started off of course by him opening his house and opening his house to these people these hippies and uh, he adapted the music to them, uh, like you know, we said, okay, you guys like to play the guitar, you like to play drums. Uh, now, in those days, I'm talking about the 1970s, church was still very traditional. There wasn't, you know, people, uh, people were still playing the organ, singing the hymns. There were not, no drums, no lead guitar, no electric guitar, none of that in the worship of the church. But Chuck Smith said, what's keeping us from using those instruments, uh, having worship that will that these hippies will feel comfortable with, right? So these people started coming to his house. And then eventually they moved to another place. They started a church uh, with all these hippie people and uh, hippies. And they like to use drums. They like to use electric guitars. They like to use having that kind of music. And that's how, you know, what today we call as contemporary Christian music, it actually started there um, in, in, in reaching these people, you know. And uh, so they, they were writing their own songs, you know. Uh, one of the hit songs in those days from the hippie, the, from the CP Motors, the title of the song was, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? That was a song, you know, and they used to sing it. And they had a lot of other songs like that. But anyway, so eventually what happened was Calvary Chapel was formed. So out of this work that Chuck Smith was doing with the hippies, Calvary Chapel was formed and lots of hippies started getting saved. So this was called, became known as the Jesus Movement. Just, just Jesus movement because these hippies were into drugs. They dropped out of life, living, you know, all kinds of things. They started getting saved, and it spread. And so Calvary Chapel started opening up all across the U.S. So many, many churches started opening up, uh, and uh, they were singing this kind of music. So drums, electric guitar, keyboard became part of. Um, uh, the worship in the church in Calvary Chapel. They started singing different songs, not the hymns that the regular churches were singing, and it spread all over the US. And so Calvary Chapel uh, became like a movement with many, many churches serving mainly these people. But from Calvary Chapel came. Out of that came, uh, and I haven't listed it here, came uh, the Vineyard Church movement, John Wimber and others, you know, uh, who, who headed up the Vineyard Church. But they were, they came out of this, you know, they were all, you know, came out of this thing. Uh, and you know, many people know Vineyard Church and what happened. Uh, they, they also spread many, many Vineyard Churches all over the world. Uh, uh, they also began to write music with, you know, contemporary music, and after that came Hillsong. So they all trace, you know, the connection you can trace back to this one, what happened here with Calvary Chapel and how music, different kind of music was introduced in the church. The key things that we can take away from here is how he adapted, He cre basically he created a church for the people he was reaching. They could not fit into the regular church. So he said, okay, we will make church something that you would like to come to, which is we will have your music. You don't have to wear shirt and tie and suit. You just come with your toned jeans and whatever. You, just come the way you are. 
with your overgrown hair and whatever you know just he just welcomed them so this was a big learning you know uh, uh, for the church as a whole that uh, you know we need to if we want to reach a community of people uh, we can't be so strict on uh, certain things which are you know like the kind of music this was this changed you know today we are singing contemporary music thanks to what happened here in the 1970s uh, but uh, they faced a lot of opposition from traditional church they were criticized for using uh, those equipments you know drums and electric guitar and you know, all of those they faced a lot of difficulty for doing that but really all he was doing was he was trying to welcome these people in to the kingdom of god you know uh, and 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 god was changing their lives god was bringing them out of drugs bringing them out of all of uh, you know the things they got they got into uh, and uh, so it's, it's it's a big learning for us you know, so to change a little bit, uh, we see other church models. We see uh, Willow Creek, Bill Hybels. So Bill Hybels, somewhere in the 80s, 1980s, um, he actually learned from Robert Schuller. Uh, you know, so Robert Schuller was, although he doesn't, I mean, when Bill, Bill Hybels was leader now, he's no longer the leader, but um, the influence was there that, he saw what Robert Schuller was doing. And so Bill Heibel said, okay, you know, I need to make church that was relevant to, more sensitive to, or more welcoming to people um, who are just seeking, you know, so they're not people who are ready for a Bible study, but they just want to explore Christ. There's something similar to the way Robert Schuller was ministering. And so Bill Heibel, Heibels came up with the seeker sensitive model. The Sunday services were very light, uh, no by strong Bible teaching, more on just talking about general things of life and how, you know, from the scriptures connecting it, but making it everything very sense, uh, accommodating to people. And again, he saw great success in the sense that, um, uh, you know, the numbers grew. There were more than, I don't know, I don't know what the number was. Numbers grew like 20,000, 30,000 people, uh, big campus, and so on. And then a lot of other churches started doing that same thing. They became, so that became known as the Seeker Sense to Model. Many other churches started copying that uh, model. And yeah, it did ha have a certain amount of success. Uh, but it had its drawbacks. The drawbacks was that uh, people were not being discipled. Uh, they were not being established in the Word of God. Uh, so that had, uh, they came to know about that, you know, 30 years later. Uh, so early 2000, 30 years later, when they looked back and they evaluated the lives of the people who had been part of the church for, the, you know, for that period of time, uh, they realized that, um, the seeker sense to model didn't necessarily i mean it drew people to christ uh, but it really didn't disciple them in christ and so they had they had to make changes which they did uh, and to emphasize more on discipling people and so on um, around the same time uh, uh, that is in the 80s 90s we see the and, and, and the seeker sense to model also spread globally a lot of churches in the Western world began to imitate that model. Um, but Purpose Driven Church, Rick Warren, became well known, uh, Saddleback Church. Uh, so he gave a little bit more structure to the discipleship process. So he said, okay, uh, if I take people through this model, uh, the purpose is to disciple them, you know, to move them from the crowd to the community, to the church. Uh, to being, you know, a Christ disciple, to being a leader. I take them through this process or this model, a clearly defined model. I can have a church that disciples people. So that was an interesting thought. And uh, so this became, again, a very 
So he pioneered the church. He demonstrated the working of this model. And of course, it became well known all over the world. And uh, so many churches around the world follow this purpose driven church model. It works uh, and it has some success. Um, then all of us familiar with Hillsong Australia. Now, you know, some bad things have happened along the way uh, with Willow Creek. And so I'm not, I'm not focusing on the negative sides, you know, uh, but anyway. So uh, Hillsong uh, Australia, again, over here, I, the main thing was worship. Uh, 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 you know, many of us are familiar. This was back in the 80s when uh, Darling Jack and others from Hillsong Church started releasing music that began to impact the church globally. Now, remember by this time, this music, the style of worship, began to be called contemporary Christian worship. But the history goes back to um, Calvary Chapel, to Vineyard Church and Vineyard Music. Slowly you had you know, Integrity and Integrity Hosea and others. They, they started playing, you know, using more in instruments in worship. And from there, Hillsong Australia picked up. And the music they released was wonderful, powerful. It saw the growth of their church and blessed the body of Christ globally. But for worship music to come out of a local church and bless the body of Christ. I think that's what Hillsong will be known for. Now, of course, there are other things happening. They have their university or um, they have their conferences and all that. But the major, major work Hillsong Church did was to release worship music that blessed the body of Christ. Um, by this time, um, very quickly, I just mentioned these two, and we'll close. Um, um, by this time, uh, people started exploring the use of satellite church and live stream and so on. Uh, and so Mars Hill, at one point, it, Mars Hill Church is no longer there today, but uh, at one point, Mars Hill Church was a very powerful uh, church, uh, not a path, but a very fast growing church in the US. And they leveraged satellite campuses. So, very quickly from their main campus, they would live stream and they opened many, many campuses um, in different places. Uh, so, it grew very fast from, to about 14, 15,000 or something like that uh, using the internet. So, Mars Hill pioneered the use of the internet uh, in terms of uh, the sermon being available online and in terms of setting up satellite churches. So, for example, in those days, in the I'm talking about the 1990s, you know, Mark Driscoll, he his sermons were like among the top top sermons downloaded on the internet. Today, of course, things are different, but they pioneered, you know, so he would preach, the sermons would go online, peop, hundreds of thousands of people would download it and listen to it. And then satellite churches were established. So we saw, okay, uh, that the internet could be used to grow the impact of, of a local church. Uh, so I said that, and then Elevation Church, again, they, they really pioneered, or, or not pioneered, but they built upon what was done before them in live stream and satellite campuses and also in worship music. So today, Elevation Church is known uh, for all of these things. And they have satellite campuses, more than 15 campuses, I think, that are live streamed. Uh, their worship music is, is impacting globally. But remember, you know, all of these churches are building upon what others have done and this, it's just, just growing, so on. So that's a lot of focus on North America. Uh, but similarly, we're seeing explosive church growth in Africa and uh, what's happening there. Maybe we'll pick this up uh, tomorrow uh, and, uh, and go from here. All right, let's uh, pause here. Uh, let me give a few minutes for some questions before we close. Everybody um, here, 
Any questions? Okay. All right. Let's close in prayer. Um, I hope all, all of you were with me. You can follow following with me. Just giving you a little overview of what's happening, what happened, Judge. Recent Judge uh, growth. Uh, could somebody just close in prayer? Thank you. Anybody wants to pray? Let's close. Father, we thank you for the, the class for today. We thank you for we are realizing the, the weight of responsibility on our shoulder because the history shows that you have a trend in which you are making a progress. And it ultimately that you come for a church that is spotless without wrinkles. Mm. And then of such things. So therefore, Lord, we ask for wisdom and understanding in where we fit in the in the history of the times, so that the responsibilities that you have um, given to us henceforth will be suitable for it, well prepared, and will finish strong in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm. That last Paul said, a crown is waiting for us that will be worthy of those crowns at the end of the day, and we will be here. Um, thou good and faithful servants as our as our accolades of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here. We commit them to their days. It will flourish and to be abundant in the name of Jesus. We are praying. We thank you for Pastor Ashes. We thank you for the great things you have laid in his heart and great things he's doing around the world. We bless his, him and his family that they will prosper and be in good health in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.